Hello and welcome to Unleashed. Unleashed is powered by Umbrex. You can visit us at umbrex.com slash unleashed to find the transcript for this show and every show. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm excited to be here today with Alex Boyd, who is the founder of Revenue Zen. It's an organic growth marketing for B2B firm. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Will. So maybe first start off by telling us a little bit about what types of clients your firm typically serves and maybe expand a bit on what organic growth marketing means. Yes. Um, so when I started this company, I started doing organic growth marketing without calling it that. So what I would do is I would go in forums, I would my website, I would write blog articles, on my LinkedIn profile, I would write posts, and people would contact us saying, I've been reading you for quite some time. Can we talk about working with you? And I realized that what this was is organic growth marketing because I wasn't using paid advertising to, to do it. I wasn't running ads. I wasn't paying for sponsorships. I was just putting into the universe the knowledge that I had. And people were saying, this really resonates with us. Can we work with you and hire you? And so that's what we do now as a service to help other B2B companies do the same thing. We help them find their voice, clarify their thought process, produce content, get it out there, and watch that turn into leads and pipeline for them. Okay, cool. And what sort of clients do you typically serve? Well, B2B clients are our focus. So if you're uh, e-commerce or media or something with a, a much smaller average order value, then there's not going to be too much you can do by posting thought leadership on LinkedIn, for example. Um, that's not going to have a return on investment for you. So our clients typically have a deal size of at least 20, if not 50 to 100K or more. Um, some of our clients sell seven-figure engagements. Um, and that really means that you can get a huge ROI from just a few really good leads. So if you have, let's just say, three people per month contact you and one or two per month buy from you based on writing LinkedIn content for your profile that's really well targeted, speaks to that audience, and you're building your network consistently, and maybe you have one or two blog posts that's bringing you another one or two leads a month that are very targeted to these you know, niche, lower volume keywords that nevertheless really describe exactly what you do, then your ROI can be huge. So we do work with software companies, we work with consultancies, we work with uh, other service providers, um, but our clients are defined by that higher than average ticket size, average engagement size, and they ideally sell digitally. So they, they um, don't only have to work locally. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really us as well. That's, that's, we do the same things for our clients that we do for ourselves, and we fit that bill as well. So we would be a good client for ourselves. All right, fantastic. Let's take a software company. And I don't know if you keep all your clients confidential or if you want to give a real example or, or sanitize it. But talk to me a bit about <clears throat> the, you know, how you help them do that service that you talked about, finding their voice, creating content. Is this something where you, you know, kind of help coach them and train them and then they go off and do the, write the content on their own or is there, are they outsourcing that content writing to you and your team and you're feeding it to them or maybe you can give me an example and also like, yeah. what's, what sort of content would a, you know, a software company be writing to, you know, generate an audience? It's actually relatively similar between a software company and a service provider. Um, I'll take one example recently. Um, one of our software companies is partnering heavily with one of our other clients, a services company, both in the FP&A space. Um, and the content that we're producing for their, their LinkedIn profiles are relatively similar. The services company focuses a bit more on the nuts and bolts of how to get it done. The software company focuses a bit more on structuring the tech as part of the process. But in either case, the process is similar. We have very smart, experienced founders who can and do write, but they're not primarily social media writers. So what we do is we first have a structured interview with them. When they're busy, we don't have to do it on a Zoom. We can just give them on a Slack channel, for example, a request for an audio note about a certain topic. We can say, hey, when it comes to how to implement your solution, um, you've mentioned that's really valuable in the past. How do you do that and why? And so uh, the hook for one of the posts we just wrote for them was financial consultants charge $10,000 or more for this. We do it for a fraction of that as part of our onboarding for our software clients. 
here's how it goes. And it's it hooks like that you wouldn't normally write, but they're really appealing to read if you were a buyer of FP&A software because you're going to think, oh, man, am I spending too much on consulting for this? Oh, okay, well, should it be just a software and a consultant? And then you read more on the post. Um, so the interview process is really where it has to shine. Um, when we write for our clients, we can coach them if they want, really want to write and they're disciplined at it, and we can just coach them. That that works too. But in many cases, I noticed that they want the coaching and they want that structured interview and they want us to produce a, a draft of content for them that they can then edit. So our client gets essentially between 80 to 95% targeted, accurate, well-written content that they can just kind of come in, add their own flavor, edit, and then we schedule and post. And they can essentially exchange some money for social media growth that brings them clients. Um, some of the people who've gone through our training and our coaching, they'll write to us and say, yeah, I'm, I'm three for three with posts, like one lead at least per post of the first three that have gone out, or they'll get two in the first post. Um, so really, whenever you're you're writing for somebody that has knowledge and expertise, whether it's software or services, um, it's that interview process of drawing out the person's expertise that makes it sing. There's no substitute for it. Uh, we can't make stuff up and have it be good content marketing. It doesn't work. It has to be the, the process of drawing that out. What are some of your favorite interview questions to help draw out that information? The origin story is the best one. So how did why did you start this company? is probably the first one. That usually forms the first good post. So most consultants and software companies haven't, founders I should say, haven't posted much on LinkedIn. So the first post that we often write for them is an origin story. It's a, here's why I did this. Um, that usually just crushes it because the, the person's network hasn't heard that story or right? they've heard it in kind of a here and there way. They've heard fractions of it. But now they're seeing it, you know, thundered from the mountaintops on LinkedIn all at once. And for the, from the audience's perspective, it's really easy for them to engage with it. Because if somebody that you know or an acquaintance comes out and says, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing, here's what the impact is, it's so easy for everyone to cheer you on. And that's why we like to write that one first. Also gives us much more background in the person themselves gives us context to why they built everything they built. Um, and most of the really good interview questions are actually clarifying questions. So something like, well, how does your software work? It's a very basic kind of high level question. And at the end of it, they'll explain how it works. And then, then we'll, we'll dig in and say, you know, something like that last one, right? Like you mentioned clients are getting a ton of value from the implementation process. Can you quantify that? What's the impact of that? And, and the, it's almost like um, the, the value is really in the, the second and th secondary and tertiary questions. It's in the follow-up questions. It's the first answer yields some surface level information. And then in the follow-up questions, you can get the really good stuff. Because, I mean, the average consultant's or software founder's first response is usually pretty superficial. But once you get deeper into it, then the good stuff comes out. And then our job is to say, okay, what's the follow-up question I need to ask to really pull this out? And then how do I take that and create poetry, not prose? And that is because a lot of people's attention spans are short if you don't lead with value right away. So we need to cut, 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 and make sure not that the content is not just insightful, but that it's short and concise enough that it can't really be tightened up much more without losing value. So if we can really pack value into every line, that's how we're going to hold people's attention span on social media. That's how we're going to get buyers uh, of our clients reading their content and just being hooked the whole time. Um, so you, you can't really waste space with content marketing. Um, if you have fluff, you'll lose people. So that's why we like to ask the superficial question first, dig in on what sounds interesting, ask that tertiary follow-up question, take that insight, shorten it, tighten it, cut it up. And that's where the good content comes from. What do you advise your clients to do once it's posted and people start liking and commenting on it, hopefully? Uh, now, obviously, sort of it goes without saying that you should reply to every comment and re reply promptly. Like we know that. But what do you suggest 
doing with like all the likes and all the people that commented should they for example you know send connection or like look through all of those likes and maybe if someone is a potential lead send them a connection request follow up with them thanks for liking the post like what do you how do you manage the the the, re, the reactions and the engagement it depends on the quantity um so at for the first thing that should happen is before the post even goes out doing more engagement will help so if you are commenting on other people's posts regularly particularly right before your post goes out your post has a much better shot of doing well um it's actually the same thing with b2b seo if you are getting backlinks and linking to high quality domains and receiving backlinks from high quality domains your your articles are likely to rank better um, it's a similar principle on linkedin with outbound commenting and engagement and another thing people should keep in mind is that those they've recently connected with and those they've exchanged direct messages with are more likely to see their content as well. So there's a few things you can do to prep the groundwork for successful posts. The most common thing that people do is skip that and then wonder why their brilliant content isn't, isn't doing anything. It's, it's algorithmic. They, they have not obeyed the karma system that is LinkedIn's algorithm and they are essentially deemed selfish in a way. They're just here to post and ghost. So prep the groundwork by engaging with others. And then when you post high value content, yes, respond to all the comments, except obviously the, the inane ones. If you get a lot of engagement, you probably get some you know, ridiculous comments that are totally off the wall and meaningless. People often say, do I have to respond to every DM, every content uh, comment? What about this one? And I'll say, no, it's not, it's not hard and fast. You can obviously skip, do what makes sense. Um, <clears throat> Then when people engage with your post, so what else can you do? I, I don't actually recommend sending a connection request and thanking someone for connecting. Um, you're a high value you know, founder or consultant or someone with a lot of knowledge. Um, you don't need to thank somebody for connecting with you on social media. Um, it should be as much of a value exchange for them as it is for you. Um, so a couple things you can do, connect with them and Include no note at all, just a blank connection request. Because remember, if you connect with people who engage with your post, they are more likely to see more content from you in the future. So that's a benefit to you already. If there's something about their profile that is a good conversation starter, for example, you did some great work with a someone they that they engage with or that they're you know coworkers with, you can mention that. Uh, if there's something you genuinely enjoy about their profile or their background, you can mention that too. Um, so treat it like a conference or a coffee shop where you wouldn't go up to someone and say, thanks for shaking my hand. That would be very weird. Yeah. But it's um, different if someone liked your post and they're a secondary connection, you know, they liked your post and, and you look at their yeah. profile, would you think it's reasonable to send them a connection request? Say, Hey, you know, you, you, you know, you, you gave a thumbs up to my post on, uh, my origin story, uh, you know, thanks for giving that, you know, thumb that like to it. Yes. You know, happy to connect with you, right? That's good. Yeah. So it depends on what the post was. So origin story, I would say, saw you in my post today. Thanks so much for your support. If it was, if the post that they engaged with was a tactical how-to post, I might say, saw you in my post today. Um, thanks for the support on that. Um, looks like, you know, Acme is you know, blah, 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 whatever, it, whatever they're doing as it relates to what you wrote about, but not in the sales way, but you can, you can strike up a conversation based on what they engaged with. So the, the thing to do always um, depends on uh, what you posted about and then what they reacted with. If they commented, uh, I would respond to them publicly a few times before taking the conversation private. If they merely liked, then I would say something maybe relevant if there is something, but the key here is don't force it. So if, there, if, you, if you're thinking to yourself, I should follow up with this person, and you really cannot think of anything interesting to say based on what they engage with, their background, then I would just skip it and wait for a better opportunity. Um, you're, you're better off following up when there's a good reason than trying to force it. So if you feel that, that, that itch of, hmm, this doesn't feel right, listen to that and just skip it and move on mm -hmm. and spend that time creating new content. And I see people fall into that trap often of the obligation to follow up. Um, don't feel obligated. It should make sense. Yeah. What about, let's say that there's someone has been posting for 
a while now, and um, someone, you know, someone's commented on their post once or twice. What are your tips to your clients on how to then transition that to a conversation and then hopefully to a live conversation? So how do you suggest people move that along? You've already talked about it a little bit, but I'd love to hear more tips around like really what to say in terms of commenting to the person, sending them a private message, sending connection requests, like, you know, kind of how do you transition that from just they comment on your post to now you're on the on a Zoom together? Yeah, that's a really good, uh, good point. Um, I will say that a lot of, so of, of the 135 or so closed one engagements that we have brought in from my LinkedIn posts and comments, the majority of those have actually been inbound. So they've been, somebody will, will write in and say, I've been following you for a while, would love to talk. Um, sometimes it's a targeted note that I send, but it's almost always an inbound. Um, if you're looking to set up a conversation with somebody, I think the things that, that work the best are um, natural conversations that don't have a direct lead into your service but are still relevant. So it shouldn't be off the wall. Like you can, if somebody, you know, comments on your post about how you had a great ski weekend, that's not really going to lead to a substantive business conversation. Um, But if somebody engages with your post and you follow up with them privately and ask a question that is very clearly a question designed to qualify them for your service, that's kind of a turnoff. So, um, you know, for example, if, if you're in um, if you're in my industry, I could ask them a post about about their SEO. So if I look at their website and say, "Hey, so I engaged with my post a couple times on um, B2B SEO the last few weeks," looks like org you know X Y Z is um, doing great at content production. Um, that's that's awesome. How have you been managing that? Is is the writers internal? I saw you know so on and so forth on your blog post. I could just sort of ask about what I see them doing. Um, if the person is at a larger company, I could comment on their role as it pertains to the company's recent public filing of their priorities and goals. Um, so I, I do like to keep it in that realm of it's to do with the thing I know about, but it isn't just one step removed from a sales conversation. Um, so one way to think about this too is pretend you're in a little micro consulting engagement. Um, what would you ask? What value would you offer? And in particular, your question has to have embedded in it your expertise. Um, ask questions that by the, by the asking reveal your expertise. Um, so if I ask, how's your SEO going? Doesn't reveal your expertise. If I ask, how have you been managing the backlink distribution to your various pieces of content? That question reveals my expertise about SEO. So you know, choose questions that that show your credibility and you, it will go a long way. That's a really good guide, I think. Hmm. Okay. What's your tips on, you mentioned commenting. So let's talk about that a little bit. One uh, thing that I've been thinking about recently is, you know, the, your normal plain old vanilla LinkedIn feed is just, can be somewhat random. Like even if you, yeah. even it just, and then if you comment on someone's post then you see even more of that person's stuff, right? Where it's, that might not be, like, let's say, I mean, you have like 10,000 connections or something. Maybe there's 100 potential leads that you'd really like to focus on, but maybe they don't post too often, so you're almost never seeing their stuff. Um, and then you hear guidance, oh, you know, just engage with people's content. But if you just rely on your feed, you're never going to see the stuff that you really should be commenting on. Yeah. What are your tips? Now, one idea that you could use is if you have a Sales Navigator account, you can actually put those people in and then Sales Navigator will tell you like, okay, you know, of these 100 people, so-and-so posted today, and they highlight it for you. But are there other tips that you have other than getting a Sales Navigator account that would allow you to focus in on the people without having to check 100 different profiles every day to see if all those people posted that day? That's a good question. There's a couple ways I approach this. So one is um, better or worse versions of what you just said, which is just some sort of tracker. Um, <clears throat> people might bookmark the po- profiles of the people they want to follow. They might have a spreadsheet to check. <clears throat> they might buy Sales Navigator. Um, I actually 
built a software that does this really efficiently. It's actually just for that exact purpose. It's called Aware. And you build lists, custom lists of people that you want to follow. And we have created, curated dynamic feeds that allow you to only engage with those people. So my target accounts list um, allows me to go there and engage with just the posts, if any, of my target account prospects. Um, I also have a partner engagement list in that as well. And I can include the link to that tool if you want after the show. But um, that's one way is just track it. Maybe use our tool, maybe use Sales Navigator, maybe use bookmarks, spreadsheets, somehow just track. Um, and the second method is, I think, a little bit more, well, you can use a tool for this too, but it's almost more effective, which is you don't actually have to engage with the prospects posts themselves, but engage with other people that also sell to that market. So if you sell to um, CFOs, you you may have some success commenting on CFOs posts, but you'll probably have more success commenting on the posts by people who also have the audience that is CFOs. So other influencers, other consultants, other software companies, um, and having that conversation in public. So think of it a bit less like, think of your target market as the people sitting in the audience and you want to be on stage either speaking or on the panel or asking questions of the panel. You don't really want to be going through the audience as much. So you'll, you'll actually get more inbound lead gen by engaging with other people in your space, other agencies, other, other consultants, other providers that work with your market than you will by trying to engage with just your prospects posts. And the reason for this is the average person, you know, business decision maker at an enterprise doing their job is not going to post that, that interesting of stuff. Usually they'll post pretty bland things because they're not trying to do what you're doing. They're not usually trying to build their brand. Um, so it's, it can be good to engage with others that are trying to build their brand in a similar space and by providing insight and showing your credibility in those circles, you're then seen by the decision makers who kind of lurk and then contact you privately. So, so to answer your question is yes, see what, what good content your prospects are creating, but don't expect too much. Um, instead, create your own content and then network and participate in content with others that sell into the same space. That's going to usually give you a more exciting, more effective outcome. Wow. I love that idea. Um, so, okay. The next question would be then, how do you find those people yeah. who are, who your audience is, your target clients are likely following? That is a good question. Um, so I've done some work in this and when we built aware, we built some, uh, pre-made influencer lists because we, have, we actually have a lot of data on which creators, consultants, influencers get the most engagement by decision makers. So we said, we're going to create a list for, you know, venture capital, renewable energy, sales, marketing, HR of the people that have the most engagement by director and up titles, because we didn't want people who get lots of engagement with non-decision makers. That's not as valid. Um, so we have some lists. Um, there, there really is no substitute for kind of finding a thread and pulling on it. So when you are going and networking in the space, have offline calls and conversations with others that also sell to your market and then follow them on LinkedIn. See who engages with them. Ask them, is there anyone that I should be following on LinkedIn? Is there anyone you think I should talk to in the space? So it really is that offline networking that does a lot of this. <clears throat> um, Pre-made lists, LinkedIn's algorithm will, will kind of do a good job of showing you kind of like Spotify will do a pretty good job of taking your music taste, getting you other stuff. Um, but supplement that that automated discovery of new people to follow with your own offline, just human to human, who should I know? You know, like ask that question, who should I know? Who should I follow? Who is producing great content here? Um, the other thing too is when you produce great content, the others who do too will find you. So I've been found a lot by others in this space that just – they're, you know, super high up. They've been doing it for a while. And then finally, I just kept producing content on my own and they engaged with me and then they noticed me. And then it was, 
you build a relationship based on that. So, so A, rely on tools. B, ask who do I know or who should I know? And then C, produce your own content and you'll attract those people. Um, so you have a few ways of doing it um, that are proactive in addition to just letting LinkedIn decide who you should see. Yeah, so I guess what, you know, one of the things I guess building on what you said would be the, the people that you really want to target, those clients, you could look at their profiles. Maybe they're not posting a lot, but perhaps they're liking posts or commenting on posts. And those are the ones that you should check out to see who are they commenting or liking because those are the people that they're following, right? Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your tool. Like, let's be a little promotional here. <laughs> Shameless self-promotion. Tell us about Aware and how it works and what it costs and so forth. Yeah. I mean, Aware is um, it's an inexpensive tool. It starts at $9 a month, and there's a $49 a month version as well. Um, we built this because I essentially was growing – on LinkedIn and building my business from LinkedIn. And I just thought, well, this is good. This is working, but what if there was a way to just do some of the things I do by hand a lot? And I started asking other people who were also having success on LinkedIn. I said, well, how much time does this take you? And they were like, oh, it takes me, you know, an hour a day at least. And I thought, well, that's just silly. Like we have all these spreadsheets, these bookmarks, these systems, and we're clicking and scrolling and getting distracted by social media. What if there was just a more focused way to organize all of this? Um, and I, I had a sales background before starting this company. And so I also thought, well, if I'm going to do stuff, it should be in CRM and all the LinkedIn activity wasn't getting into CRM. I mean, who's logging? I commented on this person's post in HubSpot. Nobody's doing that. Um, so we built aware with the notion that if you could simply orchestrate your LinkedIn activity in one platform, so building the lists of who you should go after, discovering new influencers, um, uh, getting a sorted, ranked, ordered top leads list of people who've engaged with you, have all your messages, your comments, uh, your connections synced to CRM, it would just be a more organized process. And so people who use Aware tend to say that they can save, you know, 45 minutes a day and they can compress an hour of LinkedIn into 10 or 20 minutes. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just much faster. It's built for lightning speed and more efficiency at doing the things that, that lead to LinkedIn success. And we know because before we built Aware, I had millions of dollars in revenue incoming from LinkedIn to prove it. And then we just said, well, we'll just make that better, faster, and stronger and make it inexpensive um, so that, you know, one one lead a month would be enough to pay for it. Um, but our, our customers get way more than that. Hmm. Um, a typical person using Aware is starting to have success on LinkedIn and wants to be more efficient with it. They're not totally fresh they haven't it's not like they've never posted um they also don't need to be a big influencer mm. um they're usually growing on linkedin and they want to do more without just making their whole their whole day about this because they have other things to do i will say something i want to hear your reaction so i'll make an assertion that uh yes it would be awesome to generate net new kind of cold inbound leads net new people from LinkedIn. And that is probably a, a one element. But a big element of posting on LinkedIn regularly or just would be staying top of mind with the people who already know you. And just so when their need comes up, they think of you first and reach out to you. So it mm -hmm. may be people that are not necessarily discovering you from your posts, but you're like reminding them that you exist and this is what you do. Yes, that's a huge part of it. So there is some cold inbound that you get, um, but a lot of it is, like if you look at my recent LinkedIn source closed one, um, if you ask me, well, did you know that person? I might say, well, yeah, we met at this thing two years ago. Or yeah, I mean, I think I exchanged an email with them once. It's, it doesn't, it's always not that they're you know, completely cold. It's there is some connection, but I put out enough content over time that they were able to just, from the comfort of their seat or their iPhone, build that relationship with me, almost in kind of a one-sided way of them soaking up all the insight that I'm putting out um, to the point where they feel enough comfort and trust of saying, well, I am I basically know how this person thinks, so I'm, I'm ready to set up a call with them. Um, and it'd be much harder to do that cold. So with cold, it, takes, it usually takes a lot longer. Yeah. Um, with some people, it can be quick. It can be they, they see one post, 
it strikes a chord with them and they have enough curiosity they reach out. Um, but one of the most common things is somebody that I sort of vaguely knew or had some connections in common with, even a former client or former prospect um, that, that will say, I've been reading your stuff for months. I've decided to reach out. It's usually months. Sometimes it's years, but it's often months. Um, and and the, the same thing goes for, we do this for our clients too. When, when, when Revenue Zen does this for our clients, they'll say, you know, um, here are the leads from LinkedIn. And we'll say, well, did you know these people? And they'll say, yeah, kind of from a while back. I worked with that guy six years ago at my last company. Well, like, you know, but that guy wasn't going to buy from you unless you, you posted this good content. And then he was reminded of you and then told his friend about you and then, then had a project um, come up that was good for you. So, so yes, you're absolutely right. It's a lot of staying top of mind. There's some cold, but it doesn't really matter because what you're doing is you're creating this beacon, this aura. And then anyone who stumbles into it, if they identify with it, if they resonate with what you're saying, they're sort of pulled into the engagement orbit. And if they have a burning pain point, then they hire you for it to solve it. Um, so you want to pull as many good people into the aura as possible and then make it easy for the ones with the burning pain to reach out and know to contact you. Um, whether they're cold or warm, they're usually some thing on the spectrum between cold and, and somewhat warm. It's possible to write a really useful, you know, post on LinkedIn that people may enjoy reading, but gets very little engagement, right? If it's written yeah. in a certain way. And you and I know that if you wanted to actually even go somewhat viral and have, you know, a number of people see it, you need to get those initial people who are seeing it, the first hundred people that LinkedIn shows it to, they need to comment or like it or repost it. And then more people need to do that. So it's only by getting engagement that LinkedIn algorithm will decide to show it to more people. So what are some of the tips that you have for your clients on how to make co content like likely to encourage that sort of engagement that that generates comments you know maybe it's asking a question at the end maybe it's you know um uh you know it's like just literally asking for a repost like hey if this if you, if you think your your connections would find this valuable you know please hit repost or something just asking for it what are some of the tips you have to you know either explicitly or implicitly try to drive that engagement Good question. So there's two two angles. One is um, overall, all things considered, more engagement is good. But many people who get a lot of business on LinkedIn don't have much engagement, um, but they have very much the right engagement from the right people. Um, there's plenty of examples of this. So one of um, one person I follow, Dan Morris, who owns a outsourced sales, fractional sales management consultancy, doesn't get that much engagement on his posts. But the people who do see it are extremely, uh, resonate with it extremely well because his content is just so targeted to that exact niche of you're a CEO with a growing business, but you're stalling out, you need to unlock growth. And, and here's how to do it through better sales leadership and then here's how we did it for our clients it's so targeted it's, it's not mass market appeal he doesn't ask for engagement he doesn't say like and comment doesn't say repost he just puts it out there and people just are compelled to reach out and that's great um there are others so you can go too far in the opposite direction you can go with you know like and subscribe for more follow me for more tips on this and that and you can almost come off as too attention focused rather than too fo well, focused on the, the subject matter. I find myself in the middle. I usually don't ask for engagement because I think it's sort of understood. We're on a social media platform. Um, the, the thing to do, people realize, is like and comment if they want. I don't really have to ask for that. Um, I'm not super against doing it, but in that valuable real estate, I tend to reserve that for insight as much as I can. Um, so with respect to getting people to view it, so you asked about hooks and getting the first people to comment. Yeah, absolutely. So I do make an effort to have the first couple lines of a post be as powerful as possible. Um, one tip I have for doing this is write your whole post. And if you did it right, you'll usually have the best line toward the end. Take that line and put it at the front of your post. 
um, often you'll have a really good punchline in the last quarter of your post and just move that up <laughs> and you'll make the, the hook of the post a lot better. Um, you do want at least 500 views in the first hour. That's ideal. Um, so, so yes, if, if you're going to write about a topic, try to balance it so it's not so broad that you're getting only attention, not um, real marketing and insight but probably also not so, so niche that you're really only appealing to 10 people. Um, somewhere in the middle is usually, usually the right balance of engagement and actual business development where you're moving the needle in their minds to contact you. How do you coach clients to prepare in case their post does go viral and gets like a million plus views? Weird things can happen in that case. They can get, yeah. you, know, you can get hundreds or even a couple thousand connection requests you can get you know people dming you so fast that you literally they just the screen scrolls faster than you can keep up with it mm -hmm. um you can get so many uh comments that it, you can't even scroll down to see them all uh what what should clients do in that scenario in that fortunate scenario to take advantage of it it, it could be fortunate it could also be unfortunate so the of the times when we've had people go viral um, this has happened more than once. Um, it usually wasn't the best day for lead gen for them. Um, so what virality often does is just boil the ocean. Um, and if it, it usually doesn't lead to that much net new pipeline. Sometimes it does, but um, the best pipeline is usually not created from virality. The best pipeline is usually created from a few inquiries, not hundreds. Um, the inquiries you'll get are often going to be a, a big mix of you know, oh my God, I love what you wrote or just other people in your in your scenario or been getting interview requests for some paper or media that has nothing to do with your audience. Um, so it's a lot of noise. Um, and yes, if, if you have a tool like Aware, it's easier to batch respond to comments, to respond to a ton at once. Um, don't feel the need to respond to everybody. Uh, you just won't be able to respond to hundreds if not thousands of people. Um, if you have a VA or a PA already in place, it can be a great thing to do to um, have them respond to people on your behalf. So what some people will do is they'll they'll give their aware account to their assistant and they'll give them some guidance and the assistant will respond on their behalf. That's one way of just kind of hacking through it all with the, with the machete basically. Um, but don't get overwhelmed. It's more than okay to just mark 50 messages as read if you don't want to respond to them all. Um, but when that noise comes, try to look for the signal. So your job is not to respond to everybody. Your job is to look for if there's anybody that's really interesting that you really should connect with. And that's probably not gonna be the loudest person. It's probably gonna be one of the quieter ones who has a thoughtful request to you know, bring you in for engagement or to buy from you, um, but isn't as loud. They won't, they won't try to get your attention as much because decision makers usually don't do that. So. Again, prioritize the things you always prioritize, which are business development, consulting, you know, sales, growth. Um, and don't worry so much about response coverage. Um, that's not as helpful and will usually be a big distraction. So I actually don't coach people into trying to go viral um, because it's usually not as effective of a mechanism for getting B2B deals. If you're consumer focused, Great, try to go viral. If you have a mobile app that costs ten dollars a year, you definitely need virality. Um, but if you're selling B2B, it's it's not necessary. It can even be distracting. So I have a, a big caveat and mixed um, guidance about trying to go viral and then what you do when if you do. Hmm. Classic questions. I'm sure you've heard these before. Best times of day, best days of the week, and how often to post. Yes. Um, there's some average evidence that Mondays and Fridays are a little bit worse than the other weekdays. It's pretty mild. Um, some people, depending on what you talk about, do better on weekdays than weekends. Again, that's just an average. It bit depends on what you talk about. Um, the time of day, I've seen, again, it's, it's a mild effect. There's some mild effect. Um, around 9-ish a.m. and lunchtime, and then the sort of 4 p.m. range, local time, wherever most of your people are, because 
I'm just rolling into work. I'm breaking off for lunch. I'm coming to the end of my day are more likely to times when I'm going to be scrolling social media than doing deep work. Um, so I'll usually try to post closer to 9 a.m. than 10, 30 a.m. Um, <clears throat> but how often to post, I think, is much more important than when. Um, and the answer to that is as often as it can be good content. Uh, I posted once a week for years and did just fine at growing the business. I'm posting closer to twice a week these days, but I have not yet invested in a really dedicated content strategy for myself that allows me to post more often than that. Because it takes a while. It's really effective to post every day if it's all good content. But if it's just okay content, you're going to water yourself down. So pick a good threshold above which your content quality has to be. And then be consistent. So if that's twice a week, great. But if that's only once a week, that's better. I'd rather have you post once a week with really good stuff than post four times a week and it's all kind of a mix of quality and, and I don't know what to expect from you. So teach your audience to expect a certain level of, co- of quality from your content. And whether that's once a week, every two weeks, whether it's five times a week, that's the answer. Um, it, it's, it's better to do that than to draw a line in the sand and say, well, I got to post this many times a week, so I've got to come up with something and then have it be really half-assed. Um, but don't, don't half-ass content in the name of frequency. Um, choose quality over that. Once you've chosen quality, if you can invest in spending three to four hours a week planning and creating good content daily, you will do better much better, but it's a big time investment. And if you're busy making a million dollars a year as a consultant, you may not want to bother doing that. Um, Depends where you are in the business and how much time you have for yourself. What about the format? So there's a lot of these posts that do pretty well. You see people that have these, uh, they're kind of these slides that you slide through, these nice square slides. What are they they creating those with typically? Are they doing that in... Is there some tool that everybody knows about except me that they're doing? Is this Canva or what, what are they using to create those nice, nice square slides? Yeah, Canva is pretty often. I mean, you can take any slide deck, export it as a PDF and upload that and it'll do it. Um, Google Slides works fine too. Um, format wise, I mean, text really is the baseline. Um, no matter what happens with technology, people will always want to read stuff and we'll always be able to read faster than we watch. So that's, that's sort of a first principle of how humans consume information is reading is really fast. So text is your baseline. A um, couple notes about other formats. Video is good, not because it's faster to consume, but because you can give people more depth. Um, if people see you on a podcast or on a video clip that you share, they can get more from you, just higher fidelity than just text. So consider mixing in video for that reason. Um, Images and carousels, like you pointed out, they can be catchy. Um, You can include more information, right? So you're you're literally less limited by the text character count of a post if you include a carousel, and you could potentially organize the information better. So choose a carousel or a document or a PDF post. We all the same thing for now. Um, If the information is best presented that way. So um, think to yourself, is this better as a write-up or as a, uh, an ordered list or as a guide? Um, guides and ordered lists can either be carousels or text posts, but just think about like, would a deck be the best way to present this information, knowing that it takes longer than reading? Um, so you're, you're not necessarily going to do better with multiple formats. Um, plenty of people have big followings, and they pretty much only post text. So that's perfectly fine. Um, I, I, again, I would don't psych yourself out with thinking, oh man, everyone's like producing this cool carousels. Like, should I, should I be doing that? Like, maybe, but um, it's not necessary. And those people aren't necessarily making more money than you. Um, I, with much less engagement and far fewer carousels, I out earn many, many, many of people who have much larger followings than I do from LinkedIn. Um, and so, again, don't psych yourself out. But if the if you think to yourself, this would be great as a deck. Awesome. Create a good PDF. Attach it to your post. It'll work great. Um, choose the format based on what you're trying to say. Okay. Um, 
what other tips do you have for folks on LinkedIn posting in particular that we haven't covered? I'd say the main last one is don't be afraid to share the secret sauce. A lot of smart people don't post because they're afraid of giving away what they think they should be paid for. But in my experience, people will will have intrigue and curiosity at social media length content, and it'll allude to your expertise. But you're not giving it any away by posting on LinkedIn. Yet people still think this often of, oh, I shouldn't post that, that they have to hire me for that. Um, they hire you for the in-depth part, for the execution of it, for the customization, for the tailoring of it. They don't hire you for the, the overall idea and insight. So share ideas and insights at will. Um, share past examples of how you tailored your insight to other clients and how those clients had success. So if, if you can keep these three things in mind, you'll do great. Uh, demonstrate credibility with your content. Highlight your past clients' results and what they did as a result of working with you. And then slow down your interactions. So when you're posting, doing those first two things, people are engaging, slowing down the interactions of taking that to a sales call. That's really the recipe for LinkedIn success. Um, put yourself out there. Don't be afraid. And people will hire you for the, the execution of tailored uh, programs, even if they saw a high-level idea in your content. So um, no one's going to steal your secret sauce. If they try, it'll be a very watered-down version because it'll be the LinkedIn version of it. Um, I've been posting our, you know, quote unquote secret sauce on LinkedIn for six years and no one's stolen it yet because we just execute on it better than anyone else. Um, and people should have confidence in that too. Alex, amazing tips. Where can people find you online? Well, we'll put my LinkedIn profile URL in the show notes because that's probably the most on the nose yet effective way to get in touch with me. Um, the two companies that I mentioned are my, my agency, Revenue Zen, which is revenuezen.com, and then our SaaS product, Aware, which is actually useaware.co. We can stick those links in the show notes too, but um, LinkedIn is a great place to just start the conversation and see what's a good fit. I have a number of ventures. I buy companies, uh, help companies sell, work with B2B companies. I have software available, um, do some coaching here and there. So um, I would just say strike up a conversation. Send me a connection request with a note. Mention you heard me on this podcast, and then we'll go from there. Alex, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining today. It's a great discussion. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Will.